Hey guys, what's up? It is Alex. Um, I hope you guys have had a great Monday. Um, I'm filming this later on Monday than I usually do, so I don't think it'll um, upload. I don't think it'll finish uploading until Tuesday. Um, but I was busy filming this whole day, um, and the project and the surprise that I was working for this past weekend was an art project. Here's a little sneak peek of it. What? Uh. Um, but you guys, as soon as I get that video edited and I figure out how to edit videos, that'll be up. Um, and yeah, so back to the book. Um, we've got a new up close and personal kind of angle. Um, but so we just left off with the end of chapter four and their, uh, the children and the professor's second trip to Wangdoodle Land. Um, so they were on the boat. They had, um, the Wiffle Bird was screaming, you're being taken for a ride. And they did not know then, but the proc was, um, looking at them from behind a rock. So they do not know about that, but we do. Very dramatic. Okay. So part two capture, chapter five, let's get started. The journey home was uneventful. The professor kept looking around as if expecting an attack, but nothing happened. He remained very puzzled. All too soon, the children found themselves back on the path by the river. Can we come here tomorrow, professor? Asked Tom. Can we go on the jolly boat again? No, Tom, the purpose of each visit is to get closer to the Wangdoodle. We must, press, we must press on to other things tomorrow, but we'll come back to the jolly boat another day, I promise you. As they came out of the tunnel and into the garden, Lindy tugged at the professor's sleeve. It was the best afternoon in the whole world, she said. The professor looked pleased. I'm glad you liked it. I enjoyed it, too. My instincts must have been correct. Our second trip came sooner than the proc expected. Though I still can't understand why the Wiffle Bird kept saying the same thing over and over again. Well, I will say goodbye now and see you all tomorrow after breakfast, if that is convenient. The children were very happy and relaxed as they walked home. Ethel cooked them a good dinner and they discovered that, in spite of all the ice cream they had, had eaten, they were still hungry. Later, even the boys were willing to retire early. They wanted to be in the quiet of their own rooms to reflect on the wonders they had seen in Wangdoodle Land that afternoon. Lindy changed into her pajamas, brushed her teeth, pulled her curtains, and was just about to turn down her coverlet when, to her surprise, she saw, neatly folded on her pillow, a bright and cheerful-looking piece of material. Her heart leapt as she recognized her scrappy cap. She ran to find the boys. Look, she said, look what was in my room. But I thought you gave it back to the professor, said Tom. I thought I did too, replied Lindy. Well, don't worry about it. Just keep it safe and give it back to him tomorrow. Long after the lights went out and the house became quiet, Lindy lay in bed clutching the hat and trying to recall why she had not remembered to give it back to the professor. She hoped he would not miss it. He might be upset. She took the scrappy cap from beneath the blankets and gazed at it in the moonlight. It certainly was pretty. On an impulse, she put it on her head and tied the ribbons beneath her chin. Lindy's curtains seemed to be moving slightly in the breeze coming through the open window. The flowers on them looked just like the flowers in Wangdoodle Land. Lindy wished that the curtains would stop moving because she felt a little dizzy. She blinked several times and looked more closely at them saw with growing excitement that it was only the flowers that were moving and not the curtains at all. She watched them swaying on their long stalks. Far out in the field, something like a plume was moving slowly backwards and forwards and, came, and coming towards her. Fascinated, Lindy watched as it came nearer and nearer. Suddenly, she realized it was not a plume at all, but a tail. The flowers at the edge of the field parted, and into her room stepped the most wonderful creature that Lindy had ever seen. It was a cat, but no ordinary cat. This one was as soft as a Persian kitten, yet as big and powerful as a mountain lion. 
He was silver gray with large velvet-like ears and glowing amber eyes. His paws were enormous, with great pads that pushed into Lindy's rug, kneading it gently. His back legs were much higher than his front legs, and all four of them were so profusely covered with shining silking f silky fur that he looked as if he were wearing a soft, voluminous pant that he were wearing soft, voluminous pantaloons. The extraordinary creature looked slowly around the room and, seeing Lindy sitting up in the bed, blinked and twitched his long tail in surprise. Oh goodness, he hissed, his voice both deep and sibilant. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I seem to have lost my way. That's all right, said Lindy faintly. Won't you please tell me who you are? I'm the high behind splinter cat. He moved around Lindy's bed, his tail trailing over the brass railing. No need to tell me who you are. I can tell at a glance that you're Miss Lindy. How do you know? she asked in surprise. I've heard the prox speak of you. The animal bunched himself and sprang very gently onto her coverlet. He was talking about you just the other day. He stretched languorously. Languorously. That fellow's a bully, I must say. I said to myself, if I ever meet that charming girl, I'm going to apologize for his for his rude behavior. The high behind Splinter Cat, would he just say rude? I don't know. The high behind Splinter Cat suddenly rolled over on his back like a playful kitten. Lindy found his head in her lap and the amber eyes gazing up at her. I wonder if you'd do me a tremendous favor? Why, of course. Her hands stroked the silky fur. Would you, uh, could you, just, just scratch beneath the chin a little? Mmm. Oh, that's the spot. A dreamy look came over his face. He pushed his nose against Lindy's hand and then rolled over again. Now, just on my back by the tail. Thank you so much. You don't know how long it's been since anyone did that for me. Lindy rubbed and scratched and the creature responded by arching his back sharply so that Lindy had to stand up in bed in order to continue. This gave the splinter cat the opportunity to wind himself around Lindy's legs and his tail passed under her chin and over her shoulder. Then, quite suddenly, he sprang lightly down from the bed. Do you mind if I look around? He asked cheerfully, stretching once again. I love seeing people's pads. This is perfectly delightful. It's probably rolled ours. Lindy quickly got, quickly got out of bed. She didn't want to miss one second of her visit with this interesting creature. Is there something I should call you? She asked. I mean, do you have a name? Oh, you can call me Kitty if you like, or Fluffy. How about Rover? But Rover is a dog's name, Lindy giggled. The cat's tail whisked across her face to stifle the sound. Shh, we mustn't wake anyone. They'd be bound to spoil the fun. The cat suddenly tensed. Wait a minute, look out. He crouched low and then gave a mighty leap forward. Lindy wasn't sure what was happening until she saw that the silky creature had hold of a little toy mouse. Be careful, she cried. That's my favorite toy. I thought it was a real one. Ooh, look what I found. He produced a large ball of wool from beneath Lindy's bed and proceeded to play with it. He patted the ball and ran after it, then tossed it in the air and rolled on his back to catch it. Lindy sat on the floor, enchanted, as the high-behind splinter cat executed a dazzling display of tricks. Oh, this is such fun, the cat threw the ball again. It bounced off his high behind. I simply adore string. He caught the ball with his tail and lobbed it the length of the room. Excuse me, he skidded across the floor. Got it. Just give me a ball of wool to play with and I'm an abs. Salute sucker. 
After several moments of play, the cat stretched out be beside Lindy on the floor. His tail switched from, si switched from side to side and he purred loudly. This has been sensational. How glad, sensational. How glad I am that I passed this way. You're a sweet girl. He nuzzled close to her and then yawned, revealing a startling row of sharp teeth. I suppose I should be getting along now. It's quite late. Oh, must you go so soon? Lindy was dismayed. You've hardly been here any time. I'm afraid I must. I don't want to go, but the beastly prrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Ben walked to the open closet and picked up Lindy's pajamas from the floor. His eyes scanned the rack of clothes. Do you know her blue slacks aren't here? Neither is her cloak. Her shoes are gone, too. What did she get dressed for? Tom scratched his head. She never dresses till after breakfast. After a thorough search of the house, the boys were more puzzled than ever. Ben said, You know, I've got a feeling something's wrong. Maybe she went over to the professor's house, suggested Tom. At seven in the morning? The boys looked at each other. Suddenly, Ben said, I think we should call him. What if we wake him up? Then it means that Lindy isn't with him, or she hasn't reached him. Either way, we ought to check. As Ben dialed the number, Tom said, Boy, if she's there, I'm really going to tell her off. What a stupid thing to do. The professor's voice came over the phone, and Ben spoke hurriedly. Hurriedly. Hello, professor? This is Ben. I'm sorry to bother you. I hope I didn't wake you. Er... Have you seen Lindy? I mean, is she with you? We can't find her, and we thought that... The professor interrupted. I know, Ben, I know. I was just about to phone you. Ben detected an anxious quality in the professor's voice. Lindy isn't with me, but I know where she is. Don't ask questions now. I'll explain when I see you. It's imperative that you come over right away. What about Ethel? What shall I tell her? Say that I invited you over for a very early breakfast. Be careful and get out of the house before she realizes Lindy isn't with you. Don't panic now, but hurry. A half hour later, the boys jumped off their bicycles and ran up the steps to the professor's front door. He was waiting for them, his face pale and angry looking. You got here quickly. Come with me. Where is Lindy? Ben asked as they followed him into the house. She's in Wangdoodle land. What? You're kidding! I'm afraid I'm not kidding, the professor said bitterly. I'm, f I'm afraid I am not kidding, the professor said bitterly. He strode up and down the room. That miserable proc, that cunning, devious demon. Apparently, late last night, Lindy received a visit from a creature called the High Behind Splinter Cat, a devastating animal, seductive and as smooth talking as you please. She must have had her sympathetic hat with her. She did, interrupted Tom. She showed it to us last night. Yes, well, I only discovered it was missing this morning. She must have forgotten to give it to me, or maybe the proc stole it. How do you know all this? asked Ben. I had a visit from the proc just before you telephoned. That telephoned. That smug devil was so pleased with himself, I could cheerfully have punched him in the nose. The thing that makes me angriest of all is that if I'd had an ounce of sense yesterday, I'd have realized what the proc was up to. What do you mean? Tom was puzzled. Well, the whole journey in the jolly boat, the wonderful afternoon and the fun we had, was all designed to lull us into a false sense of security. Lindy had such a good time that she completely forgot her fears. By the time the splinter cat finished his charming act, Lindy was more than willing to go with him. Now I understand what the wiffle bird was trying to tell us. We were being taken for a ride, and I was just too stupid to see that it was all part of the proc's evil plan. Ben was furious. You know, kidnapping is a crime. What are they going to do with Lindy? Tom asked with concern. She must be really scared. I don't think so, said the professor. The proc informed me that she is happy and will be well taken care of. He will release her when I promise on my honor to give up trying to reach the Wangdoodle. I have until tomorrow morning to give him my decision. Of course, I'll agree to his terms. You mean we have to give up the whole adventure? Ben said in a horrified voice. I'm afraid so. But why, cried Tom. Why not just call the prox bluff? I'm sure he wouldn't do anything to hurt Lindy. You said yourself that all the creatures in Wangdoodle Land are peace-loving. Yes, Tom, but I sense that the prox getting desperate. Remember, he feels that, the Wang that Wangdoodle Land is in great danger. With so much at stake, he might not harm Lindy, but he could keep her there indefinitely. But there must be something we can do, Tom said desperately. It just turns me inside out to think that the proc has won, and we'll never get to see the wangdoodle. Wait a minute, Ben looked up suddenly. You don't have to give the proc an answer before tomorrow, right, Professor? That's right. Well, then why don't we just go and try to rescue Lindy now while we've still got time? What a great idea, Tom said excitedly. We could sneak in and get her out of wangdoodle land before the proc knew anything about it. He'd never expect us to do something like that. Hold on, hold on, the professor said. I'm not sure that's wise. The proc could capture us too. Then where would we be? It is a risk, agreed Ben. But we could be extra careful. I'll bet the wiffle bird would help us. 
Oh, go on, Professor, say we can do it, urged Tom. This is the one chance we have to put things right. Then we could still try to see the wangdoodle if we wanted to. Well, I must say I do hate to give up the experiment, the Professor wavered. We can't give up now after all our hard work. You know Wang Doodle Land better than anyone. You could take us to find Lindy. I know you could. Please say yes, Ben pleaded. The professor walked to the French windows and gazed out across the lawn. After what seemed like an eternity, he said quietly, Very well. We will try it. Perhaps we'll be lucky and find Lindy before anyone finds us. He turned to the boys. I shall phone your house and speak to Ethel. I will tell her that we've planned an excursion. Tom said, she won't mind that. Mom told her that we'd be spending a lot of time with you. Good, but on second thought, it might be better to tell her we'll be gone for a few days. That way, if something unexpected happens and we're delayed, she won't worry. If she thinks we'll be gone a few days, she'll expect us to take some clean clothes, Ben pointed out. That's using your head, replied the professor. You'd better go back home and pick up some things. Get something for Lindy, too. I'll have Mrs. Primrose prepare us a good hot breakfast before we leave. It could be the last meal we'll get for a while. Now let's hurry. Wangdoodleland is a large country and we don't know where Lindy is. We haven't a moment to lose. Lindy was beginning to feel anxious. It seemed as if she had been walking for hours. Dear friend, are you getting weary? The splinter cat asked. Would you like a ride? Before Lindy could answer, the cat's tail encircled her waist, lifted her high into the air, and deposited her gently on his back. There, now isn't that nice? Much more fun, too. Lindy had to admit that sitting on the splinter cat's back was much better than walking, even though she had a tendency to slide forward since the cat's behind was so much higher than his front but she soon made herself comfortable by hooking one arm around the cat's tail and tucking one leg under herself. A brilliant sun came up over the horizon, bathing everything in a soft pink glow. The spring-like air carried tantalizing aromas of popcorn and cinnamon toast that wafted past Lindy's nostrils, reminding her that she was rather hungry. She knew instinctively the smells were coming from the unusual shrubs and bushes so abundant in this area. She made a mental note to tell the professor about it when she saw him. They came to the bottom of a big mountain. Hold on tight now, said the splinter cat, and he began to climb. Sure-footedly, he moved up the almost vertical face of the rock. This is where my long back legs come very useful, he said. They make going up mountains so easy. Lindy shuddered to think of what would happen if she fell off the splinter cat's back. She took a firmer grip on his tail and told herself not to be afraid. They reached a wide plateau. There were boulders and rocks lying as if a giant hand had scattered them about the landscape. There were trees, too, short scrubby ones that were shiny black like patent leather, and larger ones with generous branches and bright melon yellow leaves and clusters. Now are you, are you ready for a surprise, said the splinter cat, lowering, lowering Lindy gently to the ground. She followed the cat into a small grove where he pointed and said proudly, There it is, home sweet home. Lindy saw a big lollipop-shaped structure which looked as if it were made of something soft and furry. At a second glance, she saw that it was a tree which was completely covered with colored yarn, laced and interlaced in such a way that the structure was strong and durable. Come and see inside, purred the splinter cat. He, ran, he sprang across the clearing and leapt into the tree, disappearing from view. And leaped into the tree, disappearing from view. Don't leave me, please don't leave me, cried Lindy. Just a minute, just a minute. The cat's head appeared through the skeins of wool, skeins? Skeins of wool and grinned at her. Then he withdrew and reappeared higher up, eyes shining mischievously. I'm sending down some stairs. A rope ladder tumbled out of the tree. It swung invitingly beside her. Come on up, called the cat. Lindy placed a foot carefully on the first rung and climbed until she, she found herself in an amazing and ingeniously built room. It was like the inside of a cocoon. The floors, walls, and ceiling were a continuous curve of geometrically woven yarn and rainbow colors. Yellow leaves in the tree pushed through the weaving and the room looked as if it were sprigged with flowers. The bottom of the cocoon was low slung, like a hammock, and it held a large, luxurious pillow. It was easily as big a bed as his it was easily as big as a bed, and it was made of silk and satin patchwork squares. It had a beautiful orange tassel at each corner. 
Come and sit by me, the splinter cat padded into the middle of the bed and sat down. Mmm, it's good to be home. He held out a large box of delicious looking candies. Have some lodge. Lindy was very hungry. She gratefully took one of the candies. It tasted of mar marzipan and honey and sweet caraway seeds. What are these? They're terrific, she said, taking another one. They are the Wang Doodle's favorite food, grinned the splinter cat. He has a very sweet tooth, you know. Lindy ate six more pieces of candy and felt a lot better. Well, how do you like my pad? The cat gazed at her and his tail brushed softly across her forehead. She blinked sleepily. Her eyelids felt heavy. I think, she said, yawning, that it's the loveliest and most beautiful place that I have ever, ever seen. A great drowsiness overcame her. She lay back and gazed up at the domed ceiling where patches of persimmon-colored sky shone through, showed through the latticework of wool. The sun shone onto the yellow leaves and they caught the light and sent reflections dancing around the room. A breeze stirred the tree. Lindy felt herself being rocked. She slipped down, down, down into the warmth and luxury of welcome sleep. All right, and that is the end of chapter six. So tomorrow we will read two more chapters, two or three more chapters. Today's challenge is I want to know your favorite candy. That's today's question. So Lindy just tried some Wodge, the Wang Doodle's favorite candy. Um, and I want to know what your favorite candy is. And I will see you guys tomorrow and I'll talk to you then. Okay, bye!